I agree with the first. Um, I agree with technologies also destroying culture. They also shape cultures. They also have positive effects or by creating new cultures that didn't exist before that. But so that was, but that was the third point. If you remember the arrow, um, technology is not only socially shaped, not only socially constructed, but technology also has an impact on society. So I agree with the first, and that means that sometimes. It, it will have the effect of destroying a culture that I personally feel very sorry about that it's happening and sometimes I'm very happy that it happened. So there again, I'm not making a value judgment, I'm making an empirical <coughs> observation that you are right, the technology also destroys cultures. Now secondly, what is the role of democracy? Um, it's ambivalent. It's not just, it's not just delaying technology. The role of democracy in the Netherlands was to create the technology of water management. Um, um, I'm, I, I think there is... Yes, I'm very happy to send you an article, if you sent me an email, where I argue how the democratic... I mean, the Netherlands is one of the oldest democratic countries in Europe, in the sense, not, not, not in the parliamentary sense, no, in the way they manage their water. The first elected bodies emerged in the Netherlands centuries before Parliament emerged in Britain or on the continent. So there was a kind of democracy in the Netherlands that actually created a certain style of technological culture, including the dives and the sluices and the water management, etc. So democracy can partly delay, but it can also shape and create. And it and it it's a very it can go it can go both ways I'm only making the argument please let's have a democratic discussion about technology because if we don't then it is the market forces or it's the big companies who do it and and I don't trust them enough coming coming uh, just to take your argument further I just uh, like to give one example of technology that has uh, come autonomously. One example would be DNA fingerprinting technology. There was no market demand. There was no social pressure. But this was an offshoot of some kind of basic research happening in an area. So there could be instances where technology develops autonomously and then is used by society. One. Uh, my second uh, comment is, uh, you mentioned, uh, and very rightly, that um, we need to get engaged and we need to keep our eyes open and understand um, various technologies that are happening, that will happen in the future, and at, at, uh, you know, try and influence and uh, take it in the right direction. Take, for instance, the technology in our country, the raging battle in our country at the moment of genetically modified crops. Now, here's a t uh, technology which, has, which is propelled by big companies. There, is, there are two major, very active interest groups working in this country, one for and another against. And the, here, it's not a question of sustainability as much as safety, safety issues. In this country, one interest group which does not want this at the moment has gone on to show that these safety measures, safety protocols are not yet in place, number one. Number two, these technologies have not proven themselves. Number three, there is serious danger of letting these uh, crops out in the open because there is no way you can recall them if things go wrong. Whereas that's not what happens in the same technology where you're using a dead bug. For example, you're making a vaccine, you're releasing it, the medicine doesn't work well, you can recall all the medicine because you're not releasing anything. Uh, so these are very serious issues. However, how this will go on, what direction it will take, how it will shape, depends entirely on which group has more influence on the powers that be. And therefore, in such a situation, and we're talking about this in a democracy, in a democracy where the interest groups who are extremely knowledgeable, um, in well-informed, were fighting this battle. Yet, at times, one 
one thinks. There's, there's very little one can do because it's, it's just the big companies that, that are working here. And those who are going to take the decision are people who get influenced by, not by knowledge and information, but other factors. So my question is, in a situation like that, what is the way out? Very briefly on the first question, um, I don't agree with you that that is an example of autonomous technology. The idea came somewhere from, but then to develop, then, then much more other factors need to be in place. But, but I, I, I much like, I'm, I'm much more like to focus on, on the second question. I have 10 slides behind this star to answer the question, but I, 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 I won't do the slides. I'll, um, one of the reasons for me to visit India is that I'm engaged in, in research that studies this problem. Um, the reason that I'm here this week is that um, together with researchers in Africa and researchers here in Hyderabad, and, and the Netherlands, we have a um, we are putting together a proposal to study new forms of democratic or to, to develop not study to develop new forms of democratic risk governance related to things like GM nanotechnologies etc. What we try to do there is to get out of the the kind of the kind of stalemate that you so well and eloquently described. That's one problem. The other problem that we try to get away from is what happened in Europe. The example of Europe showed that the Monsantos of this world are not all powerful. They tried to get into Europe and it was stopped. There is no GM food in Europe. You can't buy it. It just doesn't get into Europe. So, Europe is an example that even in a, I think, in a too radical way, Europe doesn't allow itself to have even a discussion about whether some elements of genetic modification might be useful and might actually be, 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 be wanted and adopted in society. The Amer United States is the other extreme. Consumers even don't know that they are buying GM food. It's not labeled. They don't know it. And the majority of the food has some component of GM in it. And India is very much in the middle. A battle that I wouldn't call democratic in, in at least my ideal sense of it's much more a battle of two forces and as, as you describe, I agree, it's very unpredictable how that, how that will develop. The Dutch government um, asked me two years ago uh, to chair a committee on nanotechnologies, basically asking to that committee advice on how to avoid this kind of stalemate each of the three positions of, 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 of extreme, the, 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 the uncritical promotion of nanotechnologies, the equally uncritical banning of nanotechnologies, or a battle of action groups. That committee came up with an advice uh, a year ago published uh, of a certain form of democratic governance of risks. The Dutch government adopted that advice. The European Commission is now discussing to also adopt it. Um, and our research project that we, that we discussed this week is trying to see how such a model might work in countries of the Global South. Uh, I'm not talking about developing countries, but countries of the Global South having distinctly different technological cultures. There we are again. I'm not claiming that a solution that works in the Netherlands will, without any ad adaptation, work in Asia or in Africa or in Latin America either. So, I think there are ways out. And, and the 10 slides would detail that, but I'll skip that. The, the core idea is that, is the idea of, basically is the idea of, of a democratic governance that gets certain experts, scientific experts, and stakeholders and citizens at the table for certain specific questions and problems. Part of the argument is let's not be naive and, and, and ask the citizens to discuss everything. I mean, personally, I'm very happy that I do not have to discuss every bicycle path in my city of Maastricht. That's what I vote once in the four years for and I don't want to be bothered by that. There are other points where I really want 
to be consulted and I want to participate in discussion as a citizen. There are other problems where I think you actually should ask scientists. There, is, there, is, there are bits and pieces in this world that scientists really have done proper research. So we should, co we should consult their advice, build it into the process, and at certain stages get in stakeholders, get in economic interest, and at other stages get in citizens. So I'll skip the details, unless two other people come back to it, then you'll get my slides. And I think there is an answer to your question, although it's not laid out in a sort of easy way. No, no, this is really about building a different and a better world, but I'm not pessimistic. Thanks. There, there he is. There, there. There, 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 right in front of you. Right in front of you, right in front of you, yeah. Sorry. Right behind you. So I, uh, I, I'm a little confused over here. I subscribe to a theory which says that in every old city in the world, in almost every old city in the world, there exists a certain area which we call the old city again, where whatever changes may happen in technology, the culture pretty much remains the same. I don't see much of cultural differences if a medieval traveler were to be traveling through uh, parts of Afghanistan or Pakistan or India, he's not going to find anything different except for perhaps the street lights or the technological inno innovations, but the practices and the culture continue to remain the same. So my question is that if I were to come into this city of Hyderabad, my own city of Hyderabad, and I see that uh, to me, I used to associate an Irani cafe with the culture of Hyderabad, and now that's suddenly changing into a masala, uh, uh, an UDP joint. So there is a change of culture happening, but I'm not seeing any technological relevance between in either of these cases. So I'm wondering whether technology really does have a bearing on the change of culture or does not. I'm not, I'm not saying that technology is the only important factor. Um, what I'm saying is that if it, I'm not saying that technology is the only important factor. I'm saying Sociologists certainly go on with your job of studying pubs and studying what the, 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 the tea culture in Iran is, but do also pay attention to the technology. And if you, I think that if you want to understand uh, the, the cafes and the tea shops and the coffee shops in Hyderabad, then you do need to think about the impact of the mobile phone. And you do need to think about the impact of, of auto uh, uh, transport technology. In that sense, that does have an effect on, uh, and, and some people are here because their mobile phone called them to the mantan through a text message. I mean, that's what I mean. That technology is is having an effect on our lives in in very in very surprising and and small, minute ways. I think that if I think that if you want to understand tea culture in Afghanistan, um, then you may not need the mobile phone. But it may be worthwhile to look into forms of heating and forms of, of carrying the tea there and forms of, of, of boiling the tea. Uh, and that is something that old-fashioned anthropologists would do. They had a subdiscipline called material culture which would do that sort of thing. But those old-fashioned anthropologists thought that they didn't have any relevance for a modern city of Hyderabad. My argument is the way that you guys, you anthropologists, studied the material culture of Afghanistan, that the core of that methodology is, is useful, is necessary in Hyderabad too. So in that sense, I maintain my claim that you do a better job in understanding whatever city or village if you also look at technology. Not only, but also look at technology. Yeah. Yeah. And Papara. we maintain the culture, there. here we'll have Irani Chai. Hello. We have Irani chai here, we maintain that culture. You need to the ambience also. <laughs> uh, one is my understanding of an anthropologist was that those who study about you know, prehistoric man and <laughs> so on and so forth. Social now, I now understand that anthropologists also study modern man. I think what you're describing are archaeologists. The archaeologists <laughs> are the guys that study the old man. The anthropologists are the people who study modern man. Okay. Now, I just wanted to know if your study takes you in this uh, particular field of technological culture, takes you to study what is happening to native communities. 
whether it is Native Americans or Native uh, Europeans, Native uh, Indians, uh, the tribes that are, you know, uh, in uh, most of Asia and Africa, what is their technological culture and how it has survived and whether their the very survival of the native communities is being threatened by the technological culture of today and as thinkers what is it that you people are proposing that we do a and secondly does uh, your last name have anything to do with the example you showed us <laughs> can, can i answer that last one first yeah. um, um, i i think that it helps my marketing that's true <laughs> But the real meaning is beekeeper, and 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 when I when I discovered that, and more 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 specifically, when my wife discovered that it actually meant beekeeper, she said, "Well, now you better do something useful after your name. So stop writing books." And I'm now also maintaining bees and producing honey. Yes, but I'm still writing books. Yes, we do. We we do study tribes in India. One of my PhD students has now for three years been studying agriculture together with, with people of uh, the Center for Sustainable Agriculture here in Hyderabad has been studying how, how tribal villages um, use their own local knowledge but innovate, innovative, innovative, adapted, uh, but not by using chemical pesticides but by using other organic very sophisticated forms of, of, of modified old classic uh, forms of, uh, of, of pest management uh, in their local cultures. Um, so the basic answer is yes, I don't see any principal reason why with this approach we would not be able to do that. Actually, um, the, the sec a second uh, PhD student of mine is studying uh, forms of water management. Uh, decentralized small-scale water management in India that brings her to, to tribal areas um, but at the same time um, we're also studying the laboratories of universities and, and, and high-flight companies and their local culture to develop nanotechnologies and to deal with the risks so um, they, they I have no hesitation with this concept to go either into a tribal village or into um, Princeton University or a company in Toronto and, and ask these kind of questions. I'm not claiming that that will immediately make a better world. I mean, I, I, I realize that this sounds extravagantly arrogant. I'm only, I mean, I'm just that modest academician that Fikram put here. I'm trying to understand better and I'm making an argument that better understanding actually allows us to try to make a better world. But I'm not claiming that I will do all the things that you hope for. One last uh, uh, addendum to my question. The techno there were certain animals which were tamed and uh, bred to do certain tasks, which also I think was a technology. Yes. Now, those kind of, those animals are threatened by technology. They have stopped breeding and the quality of animals has deteriorated. Is there anything in your study to do with the domesticated animals which are used for uh, labor by man, which have been replaced by machine? Is there anything on that which you can enlighten us? No, I'm sorry, but 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 only in the sort of empirical sense. I don't know. I mean, I I recognize what you are saying. I but I only recognize it as a newspaper reader. Um, but I, I have not done any research in it. I'm sure that with this perspective, looking at that problem. Um, we would get a more subtle understanding of what is going on, and actually might be. I mean, it's not. It's certainly not a strange idea to think that we might come to the conclusion that actually those farmers would be helped better, better in 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 the, in the broad sense of sustainability, not in a narrow financial sense, but in the broader sense of sustainability, would be helped better with ways of maintaining their animals rather than with 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 adopting the new machines. I wouldn't be surprised if that is the outcome, but I don't know. Maybe they should buy the new machines. I am not anti-technology. I'm I'm arguing for a better a better understanding of the subtlety of the relation between technology and society. 
uh, this is the context of green economics, uh, carbon footprint. You have any idea or you can comment on the product called Kindle, which is presently in the U.S. specifically is going to move on. Any idea? I don't, I don't recognize it. It's, it's an electronic newspaper. The e-book e reader. E-book e reader. Amazon. Uh -huh. Kindle. Yeah. Amazon. The Amazon. Rather. <coughs> Basically, I, no, I think I should shut up. <laughs> I'm the sort of guy that can talk about anything, but I, I should show that I also can shut up when I really feel I'm not an expert. So, I'm sorry, it would be very worthwhile looking into it, but I haven't done it, and I should shut up, in all modesty. Yeah. Hello? Can you hear me? I can certainly hear you, but I can't see you, but <laughs> hearing is more important. Uh, the lady was talking about other factors that stop the democratic process. I wanted your idea about voting in India. We have some of the best systems of what do they call them automated voting machines. But we have some of the least educated voters in the world. The largest number. Now, another technology is biometrics for voter identification and other uses. Do you have anything to enlighten us on those subjects? As oh, sorry. refers here. And second question for you particularly, regarding those floods. We recently had a catastrophe on a river called the Kosi. Yes, I followed it. I wonder how much interaction our government has had. And this refers to political leaders steering the way to technology. How much interaction has the Indian government had with the Netherlands? to bring in those, that technology of dikes to India? To, to, to start with the letter, as far as I know, no. I followed the Cozy River disaster pretty closely, uh, but I only followed it on the side. I haven't really started reading the... I mean, I, I collected everything that I, that, I, that I received through email. I'm, I'm on the list, the discussion list. Um, and I, I kept all the documents, but I haven't really sat down and, and, and wrote about it. But I haven't seen any reference to the Dutch. Um, and there are some very, there are very, well, nice is a very nasty word here, but, but a cynical word. But there are some very good examples in the Cozy story to, to basically support several of the points that I'm making. But basically, no, no Dutch involvement in, in either the preparation of the, the Cozy embankment or what is happening now, <coughs> as far as I know. Your first question, voting machines are a researcher's delight. I mean, you're talking about India, but I guess that many of you will remember four years ago, Florida. I mean, wasn't that a beautiful case of, of how technology can partly disrupt democracy and, and social cohesion? And the course of history. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, another case um, is that the Netherlands um, uh, now since two years have been all voting machines because increasingly it became clear and it was, it was becoming a slightly embarrassing story for the government that it was possible to, to hack these machines. So there were, I, I don't think that anyone was interested in doing it but you could imagine a hacker sitting next to the school where the, where the, voting, where the voting took place with this small laptop uh, and she could actually tinker with the votes. Um, and, and then the company and the engineer said, we'll fix it. And they came with a new prototype. And then the hackers came and they hacked it again. <laughs> and there was a second prototype. We fixed it, the engineer. No. So by now we are back to the red pencil, which I like, actually. <laughs> um, so the voting machines, but let, no, now more seriously, um, The technology of voting, whether it's a red pencil or, or, or raising your hand or coming in, moving to one side of the room or the other side of the room, as the Americans do in their primaries, uh, or using the voting machine, again, I would say you can only understand what is happening there if you study the larger culture around that voting machine. And I can imagine that certain cultures would not be happy with the red pencil and would 
would might even consider it um, a sort of downgrading the quality of democracy. Personally, I think the other way around. And I think generally the Dutch are pretty happy with the red pencil now. Um, my argument would be, it's great to look at that voting machine. Actually, some colleagues of mine in the United States have done that in the case of, of Florida. So they took the voting uh, controversy around the machines in Florida to have a larger story about American uh, democratic culture around, uh, around elections. So it's a great idea. So, what the values are uh, the culture, the in uh, the affordability as well as the uh, comfortability, our passions play a role of technological advances or innovations. I think I think they play a role. I think they play a role, but you can't predict how much of a role they play. I'm pretty sure that my Mac is much more comfortable than your Windows machines. But still, you all have Windows machines. So comfort, comfort, user friendliness, they play a role, but it's, you can't predict how much of a role it will play, whether it will tip the balance one way or the other. Um, you're of the generation that, that probably also have had the, 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 the other video recording systems, not the VHS system that in the end won, but some of the other systems like Betamax. No, I don't see any recognition. Anyway, anyway, that 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 was that could do much better uh, videoing than the v the VHS to which we then moved. We we lost that again. Um, so it is important, but you can't predict how important. That is part of the whole play of forces and interactions, um, and you can't predict it. The only argument I can make is pay attention to it. Because if you don't ask the question how comfortable, but also how affordable, because I mean, I realize that the Mac is slightly less affordable than the Windows machine. True, true. Uh, if you don't pay attention to those factors, you're only telling half of the story, and you're quite possibly uh, losing an important element to understand both the development of technology, sorry, both the development of technology and the interaction of that technology with society. So it plays a role, but not in any predictable sense. Uh, Dr. Baika. <coughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, do you see, uh, say, 50 years, 100 years, 500 years from now, uh, a sort of convergence of uh, uh, various uh, cultures and uh, disappearance of uh, diver <coughs> diversity among these cultures? Because if you look at uh, <coughs> what we call as the upmarket culture, irrespective of the country in which you are, it tends to uh, converge. I mean, uh, th there is uh, a greater similarity uh, in uh, the upper segments of uh, the society. So, given, uh, you know, technological advancement and affordability, over a period of time, do you see that uh, microculture is disappearing? I'll, I'll, I'll give you two answers. I'll be... I'll be rather non-academic in my first answer, and I'll give you a very normative answer. So I'll tell you what I hope, what I like, what I want. And what I want is that that is not going to happen. What I hope is that there will, there will remain a plurality of cultures. Um, but that's a normative statement. That is a value statement that I'm making. You may disagree with it, and it certainly doesn't say anything about what empirically will happen. Empirically, I'm not pessimistic. Well, just a brief footnote. When people make optimistic or pessimistic sentences, that always says more about them and their character than about the world that they speak about. But anyway, so I'm, I'm still fairly optimistic. I'll give you one piece of evidence. In Europe, we have been... We, you followed some of that in the newspaper. We have been moving to the European Union. And... and it has had its ups and downs, but, but we moved into the Union. We've had, we didn't have any war since, since 60 years, so there's a little bit of progress. We have even one euro, which some people consider a progress. Did that mean uh, a harmonization of culture? Did that imply that there is now increasingly one European culture? No, on the contrary. One of the effects of the European Union has been that regions have become more important. 
One of the effects of the European Union, I think, is that now in almost all European countries, you don't, you do not only have the national state broadcasting stations, but there are regional broadcasting stations. Only in the Netherlands there are already six different languages broadcasted on TV and on radio. Mind you, I'm not talking about the richness of India with it, what is it, 23 languages with scriptures and literature and everything. We didn't have anything like that. The Netherlands had one language and, and one radio and television station. And that was used quite strategically, as, as the French sociologist Bourdieu described, to also forge the unity of that nation, Netherlands. But from that unity and that monopoly and that homogeneity of one Dutch culture with one language and one style of making TV, we now have about six or seven different TV, radio stations, literatures, poetry. So rather than a unifying effect, it has, it has had, in certain ways, not in all, I mean, we've only one coin, we've only one, one euro, but in other ways, um, it, it diversified. And, and, in, and, and in an interesting way, it diversified in a way that actually went across the borders. So in my region, in Maastricht, you saw where Maastricht was, here, down, very close to Germany and Belgium. In some sense, for some instances, some exhibitions, some art, some art activities, the region, including bits of Belgium and bits of Germany, is much more important than what's happening in Amsterdam and The Hague. So a new, a new ordering of the world is emerging because of the harmonization and the unification of Europe. So I think that both movements are happening, but not necessarily uh, leading to more homogeneity. I personally think that there is hope that, that Handloom, following the kind of argument that I have given, will, will be sustainable and will remain there. Possibly, because market forces are important, possibly by providing cloth for a very elite top part of the market. Fine. I wouldn't mind if that, if that creates a sustainable life for these weavers and these weaving villages. It also would create a more sustainable textile culture in India. And so in that sense, I'm not convinced that necessarily the push of technology will create a more homogeneous, in this case, only mill-produced form of textile culture. After having heard you, Professor uh, Ajayya, uh, I was wondering what prompted you to mention the Gujarat uh, riots of 2002 uh, in, uh, in the background of technology and culture. Where does that come in? Um, when I send you when I send you my title, which was different from this title, uh, the title was the vulnerability in technological cultures. And as you, as most of you may have read, what I what I proposed to talk about was how, on the basis of this kind of perspective, on the basis of looking at technological culture in this broad sense, looking at sustainability, democracy in this broad sense, how, from that perspective, I'm proposing and I'm doing research, and that's what goes in my nanotechnologies and my GM food uh, democracy debate. I'm proposing another way of dealing with risks and dealing with vulnerability. And um, in that line of arguing, um, what is currently happening in Gujarat um, was an example. Now then you said, well, let's change the title, make it a bit more general, let's skip the vulnerability and let's talk about technology and culture. Um, I. I like the idea, I visited the, the, the Mantan uh, website, so I, I sort of got, got a better idea of the audience and of previous talks, and I decided um, to give this talk. So, risk vulnerability out, Gujarat out. <laughs> <laughs> if you still want to know what I would have said, yeah, yeah. Oh, but there's another question here. No, no, after I, that, after, after, I, just, after that. I just wanted to ask, see, currently there is a progress happening in Gujarat, so you can't say currently. It's decade back what has happened in 2006. Six years ago. So, no, no, seven years back. Can, can <laughs> we have you share that, please? Because I, that was my unasked question, frankly. I mean, 
what the question he asked. I wanted to ask the question. Please use the mic. Use the mic. No, no. She's just She's asking just adding pressure on me. It's very simple. She's just adding pressure. I was trying to escape. What point does this end? <laughs> when, the, when you see the audience getting up. See, Narendra okay. Modi. No, my argument was, or the argument that, I'll start a little bit back. I, I'll, I'll honestly try to answer it, but um, I'll, I'll start a little bit back. Together with a group of Indian scholars, activists, practitioners, I'm involved in a project which we briefly call for ourselves. We'll probably not use that in public later, so you're all asked to forget it after I said it. <laughs> we call it Rewriting Hind Swaraj for the 21st Century. The idea being that Hind Swaraj was written 99 years ago about the self-rule of India. What we try to do, or these Indians, I'm just the European guy who happily walks along and, and tries to learn from it. What we try to do is to think what self-rule for India would mean in terms of its science and technology for building a better society. So, Hind Swaraj for the 21st century for the role of science and technology. It's part of a larger project where the same thing happens in Africa. Next week I'll be in Kenya and there will be works of the same workshop that we had in November at the 99th birthday of Hind Swaraj in Gujarat. So there will be an African project of three years trying to, well they don't have a Hind Swaraj, but trying to think what would be an agenda for science and technology development that meets the needs of countries in Africa? As the question that we posed here, what would be a science and technology policy? What would be self-rule of science and technology for India? What would be a way of doing nanotechnology, GM, not by importing it from Monsanto, but by developing it on India's own terms? So that's the larger project. It's a three-year project funded by the European Union, a, a, large, a large chapter in India and a chapter in Africa. That process started in November in Gujarat. And it started in the Tribal Academy. Um, also, to st we, well, we went past the, 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 uh, the, uh, the ashram in Ahmedabad and we had, had the workshop in the tribal village in Tejgat. Also to symbolize that this is not an academic affair, but that we really try, even in a physical sense, to base this kind of work on, on, on what is going on in, in places like that. Now one of the things that, that happened there, um, one of the things that the Indian colleagues contributed, indeed, the colleagues working in, um, or in Gandhi Nagar, um, was an analysis, not just of the technology, but indeed of the wider political and technological culture of Ahmedabad, and analyzing what that does with the vulnerability of communities there. And, and it seemed to carry us quite far from the role of science and technology, but but by now, you're sort of used of my doing that. I end, up, I end up talking about lots of things that have nothing to do with dikes or with bicycles. And that happened in November in Gujarat too. So one of the things that, that my colleagues in Gujarat argued is that if you want to understand what happened in the wake after the Gujarat riots, let's call them riots for short, although I think there's a very good argument that they were not riots, that they were much more staged and much more... Uh, uh, governed with the use of technologies like mobile phones and, the bu and, and technologies like the bureaucracy of the government, of the Modi government. All those technologies went into those riots, which because of that you shouldn't call riots. Riots are mob actions, unplanned, unpleasant, and relatively brief. In that sense these were not riots, but let's call them Gujarat riots and everyone knows what I'm talking about. If you analyze what happened afterwards to the Muslim minority there, then what you see is that 
they are denied their own history. They are denied their own stories. They can't. They are denied a place in the in the modern, current development of Gujarat. There is this probably the most booming uh, corridor with with uh, with industries and 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 uh, high level educational institutes between Ahmedabad and Gandhinagar. Gandhinagar itself is one place full of universities. And, and, and high level firms. But the whole corridor to Ahmedabad quite ironically ending at the at the Ashram uh, where where the salt march started. That whole corridor is an example of creating a certain technological culture and in the wake of that technological culture it's not only technology policy but it's also identity policy that is played. And and the identity policy of of putting putting this Muslim minority in a in an in an impossible double line, um, they they are in some sense invited to participate. But if they are participating, then they should forget their own history and their own story. If they forget their own stories and their own history, they basically give up their identity. And if they are not prepared to do that, they are not allowed to participate. And they are and they and they are marginalized in that society. And the and the old ideal world of Gujarat where, where I mean, it's not that long ago when Hindus and Muslims lived next to each other in Ahmedabad that world is very rapidly disappearing and my argument is that if you again again I mean I only have one story to tell one sentence to say is that if you want to understand what is now happening in Gujarat to the Muslim minority you also have to look at the technology policy of the Mori government and you also, if you want to, under to understand what happened seven, eight years ago, you have to look into the technology of the mobile phone and the technology of the bureaucracy, etc., etc. That was my point. Now you can. Yes. Now you can. Yes, so they can. kill me if you wish. Yes. The rate of. Uh the technology takes long time to trickle down to masses. We had Maruti once in 1975, I suppose. Now we are going to have. You want water? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Yes. So you are talking about nano. So nano takes a, takes a long time to come down to masses. The rate of change in societies is very slow in comparison to the change in technology. But yet, MNCs, Fortune 500s, and I don't know whether it is market forces or the vested interest. They stop technology to go to masses. Now, is there any way of tackling this situation? And where do we intervene to get appropriate technology for the masses? The, um, and are there any examples for it? Yes. Yes. Um, I will give you two examples. The trouble with the second example is that it, it requires some very difficult words that I've forgotten. So I'll have to talk around that. But the core of the example is right. Um, so let's start with that difficult one. Then you will only remember the one that, that I can fluently present. The difficult one is an Indian example of a medicine, um, which is a nanotechnology medicine. You need nanotechnology to produce it. It is about a certain. It is a medicine that takes care, that that is used to to treat a certain fever, a fever that is very common. So I'm not talking about a lifestyle disease. No, it's a it's a it's a fever that the poor in India have, but the current medicine is very expensive. This nanotechnology um, is able to have. It, 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 it's basically a drug delivery system um, that packages the drug in a very easy and mass-produced way that allows much larger masses to benefit from this medicine than is currently the case. Um, it is, it's already in production, it hasn't been rolled out yet, but it is an example of where a nanotechnology actually is, well, is being rolled out to the masses and is, is designed to benefit the poor, basically. Second example is from Kenya. I mean, I'm again talking about this same group of people. Uh, the example in Kenya is that um, 
uh, this physics professor with whom I'm collaborating, they they realized, when he is a Kenyan, he has been down in the countryside, he realizes, he realized that pottery makers in Kenya, they use a certain plant, um, they boil that plant, the water gets very slimy and a bit thick, that water they use to coat their pottery in, and the pottery then becomes much and much stronger. It's centuries old, he doesn't know how old it is, but all the pottery makers in Kenya do that. He took those potteries to his lab, he analyzed what happened, uh, what the plant did to the water, what the water did to the clay, and after analyzing that, he found a nanotechnology way to mass produce that kind of pottery. Which is, again, it's not a lifestyle technology, it is benefiting uh, the same people that used to buy this pottery, uh, but, but, but now it's mass produced. So there are examples and we're looking for other examples. There are examples where nanotechnology can actually be made useful for much larger masses of people than only, I mean, in the Netherlands we can buy these shirts that change color when you enter the, 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 the disco or that, that change, that, that, that help you maintain your temperature. Sort of lifestyle kind of things. We're not interested in that for this project. Uh, and I think there is an increasing amount of possibilities to indeed do the sort of things that you're asking for. About MNCs and uh, Fortune 500 to try to stop. How how do you how do you make vested interest to stop the technology reaching to the masses? Are there any examples for that? Um, the question is how. I'm not sure I. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. But are you asking how I? could stop a technology to reach the masses. I don't, I don't want to stop Western it. Western interests would like to stop, like... Yes, yeah, of course. But then I would say we're already one step further if we understand the kind of mechanisms that are at play there. So if we understand how the, the sort of interest that got into Monsanto to prevent other forms of pest management, then in, democ in democratic systems we are also better to deal with Monsanto. I'm not saying that from now on, from this talk on, onwards, from tomorrow morning, Monsanto is, um, um, I mean, dances to my tune. But I am arguing that to deal with that problem, uh, this analysis helps, because you get a better grasp of all the forces that play, including the forces of capital and the forces of international uh, trade, etc. Um, and I think that, that, I mean, in that sense, I'm a very old-fashioned 19th century Enlightenment person. I think that better understanding won't harm you. Whether it will enough, be enough to stop Monsanto, I don't know either. I guess I have to stop. Uh, I just want one. Hey, yeah, I'm gonna. The last one, the lady has. Since you gave us uh, the permission a little while ago to kill you, I'm going to take a chance. <laughs> <laughs> in one of your slides you mentioned Sharad Chandra in 1926 wrote that Muslims don't have a culture. I think it has been a misreading of what he has written. Anyone who has re read a lot of Sharad Chandra would tell you the man was such that he could not have written something like that. So it's pro probably taken, you know, read out of context or misread. Thank you. I'm very happy with that. I don't know the guy, but I was very shocked by the <coughs> quotation, so this is a relief. Thank you. When you came in, Vivek, you said that uh, a topic on politics would draw a crowd which would be much larger than um, what one would have on technology and culture. But uh, we probably had more questions and more engagement by our audience in today's talk than we had on um, several other talks on, on, on issues of policy and governance. That only shows uh, how engaging your talk was. Many, many thanks to you. Thank you very much. It was indeed very nice. May I ask Falguni to offer this memento to Professor Biker on behalf of all of us? He'll hopefully remember us and come again. Yeah. Thank you and uh, look forward to something interesting in February as well. Thank you ladies and gentlemen. Good night. Thank you, Thank you very much.